this time on Graveyard Cars. Gunning for his father's self-created title of number one painter, Brody solos the jams on a 68 Charger in what is possibly Mark's least favorite color. Going DG1, which Mark calls poop box green. Tony and Mark return to the brother's car collection to scope out a remarkably rare 71 Hemi Challenger RT sunroof car which may be the most optioned 71 Challenger in existence. But will this million dollar Mopar meeting of the minds turn maniacal? It's a 71. It's true psychopathy, it's sick. Brody's bad luck with black cars means more training from Will. So when they tackle a 68 Charger in single stage black, how much of this bullet tribute car will Brody be allowed to paint? Beneath the fog, behind the rust, sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. On the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> with Mopar Perfection. This is Graveyard Cars. So today we have our 1968 Charger that's getting all of its jam work. It's going DG1, which Mark calls poop box green. It's the same color as Royal's car. Mark's colorblind, so who knows what he sees and what he doesn't see. So this is his first car that I've just cut him loose on. But he's pretty much figured that out, good luck. So we're at that point now, Brody's been here for two years being my helper and my son. But it's time for him to kind of just do his own thing. He's been doing a great job prepping, he's been doing a lot of jam work, and I have him doing a lot of jam work on the areas that aren't visible. So this is an engine department. This is gonna be his first time where if he screws something up, we're gonna have to go back and fix it. This Charger is the first car my dad has let me prep and paint completely on my own. So I've done jam work before, here and there, little things. I did the, the jam work for the Daytona Tribute car. So I was definitely excited for the engine bay, but it was nerve wracking for sure. The engine compartment is a focal point on one of these cars. So making sure the engine bay is complete with no imperfections, completely covered and clear, it's very time consuming. So after the base coat is applied, I make sure it's completely covered and it looks good. I go and mix out the clear and then lay three coats of clear. So the clear is honestly probably the easiest part because when you're sitting there and you're spraying it, you can definitely tell what hasn't gotten enough or what has gotten enough, so it covers perfectly. This one came out really nice and I'm sure Dad's gonna be proud. So I, I truly let Brody go in and just do his own thing. It is a metallic, so there is some finesse and you really gotta be careful. I went in when he thought he was done, checked over everything, everything looked really good and he did a great job on it. I couldn't be more proud. I would be remiss not to say the guys are doing a fantastic job right now. I do like to give them crap about it. It's fun, right? It's fun for everybody. But man, I think part of it is you get used to things. You walk through here and you're used to seeing all these cars and beautiful paint jobs. You say, well, that's what we do, that's what we do. But somebody from the outside comes in and says, holy cow, that's a miracle what you're doing. It really kind of grounds you and makes you realize that's true. So whether it's Brody or, or Brian or Dylan, Will's other son, or Will, the paint shop, the metal shop, Dougie, everybody in the restoration is doing a fantastic job. So these guys are working, in some cases, they're working on cars upwards of a million dollars. If you go back and you look at uh, Wendell Malmberg's 1971 Hemi Cuda, you know, that is a million dollar car today. It's all numbers matching and we saved it. Mr. Torino's 1970 Coronet RT, one of only two ever made, only one left in the world. That's about a 1.5 million, maybe more now with the inflation and everything. 
But the guys who worked on it as it went through the shop treated it exactly like every other car, like a 66 Hemi Charger or like a 72 Duster. Their goal is to maintain a constant operating procedure on every single car as a team. It can't be overstated that they are doing a fantastic job and I really believe we are the premier auto restoration shop in the country, at least for the Mopar cars. So when I'm doing a, a complete paint job on a base clear, it takes me about two days because with a base coat, it took about six, seven, eight coats of color. The last two coats are like a drop coat to ensure the metallic laid out right. And we're filming that for you guys at home. So there's just a lot of time into getting the color done and getting it right. We finished with about three gallons of color actually going on the car. Once that process is done, it's taken most of the day. I let the car just kind of breathe a little bit, gas out completely, come in the next day, do my clear coat, everything, the body lines come out sleek and this car is amazing. So one of the things that I find funny because it's kind of an anomaly, cars will come through here in, in a series, in, in pairs or triplets, right? You've just seen us paint a green 68 Dodge Charger. A couple episodes ago, we delivered a 1969 Hemi Charger. It was absolutely beautiful. Now we're working on a 68 Charger that's getting painted black. However, this particular car has been here a long time waiting. I bought this car about five years ago. When I bought the car, it was all painted up like a General Lee, but it was a good car. It was a 383 four barrel factory car and it was a solid car. So when a guy called me up and said, hey, I'd like to have a 68 Charger, I wanna paint it black, I wanna do all these cool things, 392 Hemi, all this stuff. I thought that's probably the best candidate I have for it, which kind of gets us to where we are right now. This guy wanted to have the 392 Mopar crate engine from seeing our SEMA CUDA for 2016. That's what really got him in love with the idea. He wanted the Tremec six-speed manual transmission in it, uh, Dana 60. He wanted to paint it black because bullet, right? The 68 Charger and bullets, black, everybody wants one. So, you know, I got no problem with doing all those things because I do think the Mopar Performance drivetrains is an absolute breeze to put in these cars now. The only thing I probably would change differently today I probably would have done the five-speed versus the six-speed because when you look at those guys fitting it in that car, you can see they're cutting up the floor. They're modifying things. They have to raise it way up. A lot of things have to change to get that to fit. Yes, it's a great transmission, but it does detract from some of the Mopar originality. So even the fact that we had to make modifications, major modifications to the floor, we've done it before. You can see that he had to raise the floor height up, he had to cut the transmission cross member area out for the torsion bars. But he was able to modify the floor and in this particular case, it's the first time we've ever done it, he figured out how he could make the console work with the six speed transmission. And we may have to play around with the shifter height a little bit here down the road, but overall it would all fit in there and only be just a little bit higher than they normally set console to seat depth. I am going to be jamming the doors and fenders for a charger in um, black. And I'm definitely excited for this. So when it comes time to this black charger, it's a pretty cool car. A couple of reasons why it's a 392. Secondly, you know, this was kind of like Brody's baby and it's a black car. So I trusted him from start to finish without hovering over him. He would block the car, get it ready asked me to double check something, I'd double check it, but he, this was his project to take from start to finish and he did a great job. It'll be interesting because I've always struggled with this color, so, but first time's a charm. It's nice to finally be able to be able to get turned loose on all this other stuff and just kind of work my way up towards a bigger project like a car. It's exciting for sure. I sprayed a few single stage colors, white, yellow, even like a light green maybe blue even, but black's definitely one that I have sprayed before. And I seem to struggle the most with, so we'll see how this goes. All right, we have a 1968 Charger that is going black. This is like the fifth black car in a row, it seems like. Brody prepped the car and did the jam work. He's gonna help me with the paint work. So normally we would go in there and seal it. And you don't have to go on a solid color. Your and Anthony's prep work has been really good. I don't feel like you guys missed anything. Now on the body of the car, 
I'll probably end up doing all of it myself just because there's no room for error, but I want you in there really watching because I know you struggle with black yeah. for whatever reason. Because when it comes to the parts, you're gonna do a lot of your painting on those parts. Then before you know it, you and Anthony will end up painting everything. And then I'll come out here distracting you guys. I might just sneak in here on a weekend and see what I can do. See, that's that same that I do to Mark. It's all full circle. Good to go. Clear yeah. basically already in it, right? Oh, you did so good. Don't it? The base is already in the single stage. Is already in it. Anyways, I'll be looking for new helpers. Number one painter, yeah, look, hit me up there. Let's see if we can find someone that knows the difference between base coat and single stage and clear coat. It's only been two years. How'd that go last time you tried to find a helper? Why is it 100 degrees? I haven't touched it. 65, 65, I sweet. Not long ago, Tony was back in town and we went up to the Brothers Collection. We showed you some of the cars that we talked about that time. One of the cars that we went over, I was really looking forward to. We went over the Reynolds car and learned a great deal, but this was another car that we went over. Tony has a lot of history with this car. This car is what Tony and I believe to be the most optioned 71 Hemi Challenger on the planet ever made. And it used to belong to his friend, Steve Giuliano. This car has it all. Power sunroof, M51. It has Hemi orange, white stripes, white interior, power windows, cassette, gotta have that in there somewhere, right? Rear spoiler, stone guard, moldings, you name it, this car has it on it. And I could not wait to take a look at it because I'm still, even at my level, I am still constantly trying to learn more about the OEM appearance of a particular part where Tony has more familiarity with the OEM parts, I need to get that way. And this car, when it was put together, was put together with all NOS parts. Okay, so we're talking 71 Challenger RT, 426 Hemi four-speed. Is it a super track pack? I think so. I think it was too, a 410. Yeah. Power sunroof? 101. And what's the code for that? I don't know, P something. Oh, is it P something? Did they change it? I don't know. What is I it? I thought it was M51, but is that's it M51? Okay. okay. No, yeah, listen, we can't expect you to know everything. I don't have okay. to know the codes. <laughs> There's books for that. Okay, why don't you, well, here's your book. Now, the rest of the options that we're seeing on the car, the white longitudinal stripe, the rocker molding. All the chrome trim back, package. The chrome trim, back edge of hood trim, belt yep. moldings. Like an SC, but not an SC. And our... The spring uh, package chrome. Goofy add-on thing, but... Tony is referring to the Reynolds Cuda, the 71. 426 Hemi four-speed loaded, most loaded 71 Cuda on the planet with options. All original car though, all original. He's saying this is the sister to it, the 71 Challenger, although it's been restored. It's loaded with a lot of the options that car has and even more because of that power sunroof. So you were saying that the 71 Hemi Cuda is the most optioned. This probably isn't far behind it. For challengers, yeah. For a challenger, I, right. I don't think there's too many things that are not optioned on this. When Tony's referring to all those moldings in it being optioned like an SC, this car is not an SC. They did not build a 1971 Challenger Special Edition. It just happens to have a lot of the options that the 70 would have if it was a real, say it was a JS29 car, a real RTSC Challenger. Somebody went right through there and clicked every one of them, making it just an incredibly rare car. I believe it's probably the highest option 71 Hemi RT Challenger. And if not the highest option, at least the coolest option one. And a funny story about the car was, I mean, I know it because Steve had bought the car. Well, technically, I had to buy the car because the seller went dark on Steve. He kept trying to get a hold of him and he just wouldn't respond to him. So I had to step in and on paper, I bought the car for, on Steve's behalf. Is this a power window car? Yes. Power yes. windows, cassette deck, obviously shaker. Air conditioning? Sure. Couldn't get air conditioning on a 426 Hemi. Oh, it's got five Check speakers. Five speakers, it's mandatory with the R36 radio. No rear defrost. It has no the, rear defroster. Has the pedal dress. And this has the later buttons, the, the true 71 buttons. This was a March built car, I believe. Oh, the button seat, yeah. Yeah, that's a good example of it. I'll tell you something else. The seat thing that Tony is pointing out there, the 1970 E-bodies, 
up through about mid-year or so, right in that range, all shared the same type of a hinge assembly for the bucket seats that make it go forward and backward, the backing, the button, they all use that same one. Then with just a subtle change, they went to a one-piece back cover mid-year, depending. I, Malberg's had, his was built in May of 1971, and it still had the 70s style backing on it. But we have seen many of them with that rolling change that went to the one-piece back, the chrome push button knob on it. This particular car did have that, and I believe this car was a March of 71, so it would make perfect sense for them to be there. Aren't those the original lug nuts? Do they have little, uh, like, nipples on the end of them? Steve was meticulous, like fanatical, you could say. And that was his passion, to make the car as correct as possible. I mean, original exhaust system, hardware. I mean, down to, like I mentioned about the lug nuts. The original assembly line lug nuts had a small bump, like a nipple, on the end of the uh, chrome lug nut. They weren't really serviced like that. So you might have to get them from assembly line workers that took stuff out and they were known as lunch pail parts. And he would run ads a lot of times in Detroit looking for parts because you would find old assembly line workers that just had this stuff laying around. How about the valve stem extensions? They have a little hole in oh. the end or is it a round ball? I think a round it's just a round peg yeah. thing, yeah. It's That's not. a later replacement one, yeah. The correct valve stem extension was a black extension, had a white insert at the end of it that was flat and had a little hole at the end of it. Now you guys don't realize this, but Tony is, I say not arguably, the most knowledgeable guy on the planet when it comes to parts. That's all he's done since he was old enough to hold a part in his hand. And he did it in the day when it was available. And he knows, he knows the minutia. I believe it says Schrader on it somewhere, if I remember correctly. It's been a long time since I, I looked at one. But he would source those and put them on the car because all the cars that had full wheel covers or trim rings used a valve stem extension. Uh, in that era. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Not amazing that he knows it. Amazing that he can remember it. Hell, I've forgotten more than I ever knew. The later version, or even at the time, the service version valve stem extensions, I've seen them with metal balls instead of the white plastic. And the later ones were white plastic, but they were domed and they weren't flat on the end and didn't have that little hole in the end. So this one doesn't have the assembly line NOS. Right. I got gotcha. you. Anything unique, you know the car, it belonged to Stu Steven Giuliano? I know way before him. Brody almost set us up for failure. Added 100 degrees in here. We had a power outage and reset the booth and no one's touched it since. It's not my fault. You gotta think of other people. Same stuff. So I'm gonna start at the back. Watch how it goes and just be a fing human. I am your son, so I don't. So, when it came time to paint this car, one of the reasons I had no problems with it is because it was black. That does show every little imperfection, but what it does is if he makes a mistake jamming the car, I can go back in there, spot it in, no big deal. You make a mistake on the outside of the car, you're either repainting half the car or the whole car, it's a big fix. But with black, I can cut him loose. If he screws up a door, that's okay. We can fix it and just reshoot the door. So I had no problems his first paint jobs being on a black one. Anything unique, you know the car, it belonged to St Steven Giuliano? I know way before him. Well, originally, it was used in some kind of promotions with Bobby Hull, the, the hockey player. And then I believe it was originally sold to a Detroit Red Wings player, Gary Unger. I know in the, in the 80s, I believe it was late 80s, Walt Downer from South Jersey, his family owned a Dodge dealership. And he was one of the pioneers in stocking up on the NOS parts to trick stuff. Walt Downer was ahead of the game as far as knowing what parts to collect and store and get them early on when they were still available. I mean, he was doing this stuff in the 80s when a lot of stuff was still available from Chrysler. And he, you know, hoarded the parts for his own cars. And, you know, he had a lot of cool cars throughout the years. He had some Hemi E-body convertibles. But this was his 71 Hemi Challenger RT sunroof car. And because he collected these parts and these cars, he threw everything he had at this car during its restoration. So the parts on this car would be impossible. I don't want to say next to impossible. No, it would be impossible to find today to put on another car again. And then it got sold to the Otis Chandler collection. Yep. 
and very wealthy investor. Oh yeah, yeah. He he owned the L.A. Times. Oh, oh yeah. Amongst another hundred or so oh. newspapers. Yeah. Did he own Brett Torino seventy Coronet RT convertible four twenty six Hemi? I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. And then through a weird chain of events, Steve had an arrangement to buy his car from Otis Chandler in the early 2000s and something happened, he couldn't make contact with them and Steve had me jump into it. So technically on paper, I bought this car <laughs> around 2002 and it was really for Steve though. Does the Department of Motor Vehicles know about that sale and the Internal Revenue Service? Yes. See now, this is a great example of psychopathy. I've talked about this before. You look at Tony when I confront him with, he did, you know, jokingly, well, did the IRS and the DMV know about all this transaction stuff? Look at his face as he consciously answers the question. Subconsciously, he hasn't got a clue because it was 30 years ago. He doesn't remember. He just knows it's the right answer. Look at his face. You can see in his face that he's having an internal struggle with right and wrong. The old is the Bible, right? It's true psychopathy. It's sick. That's the kind of thing I watch every night on Investigation Discovery. Some guy's saying, why'd you kill everybody? Well, they was home. <laughs> Same oh, amount. I didn't yeah. make anything, it was my friend. Aw, so. you're such a sweet guy, Tony. It was for him, it was on his behalf. <laughs> I wasn't ready to spend that kind of money on a car. <laughs> a couple years after Steve had bought the, the Reynolds Cuda, it was when he was trying to buy this, uh, the Hemi Challenger sunroof car, the one that I technically ended up buying. And I believe if memory serves me correct, it was around 175,000. Back then, it was, that was record money paid for a Hemi Challenger or hardtop. Weren't you looking at the Reynolds yeah. Hemi Cuda for that kind of dough too? That was a little bit less, and it was a survivor. Yeah, and they're only original ones. Right. This car's been completely restored, right as rain, yeah. good parts, all right. that, but still never original. Again, Challengers are a little behind uh, values for Cuda, where Cuda's where they always are and still are today. I mean, that's probably the best Challenger or a bunch as far as equipment and looks wise and everything. It's got that four speed too. But it, that wasn't something that was just a slam dunk. One of the reasons why Steve was able to get the car was because a lot of the collectors, at least at that time, they were like real estate uh, investors. They would go buy comps, like what's something that lasts sold for. Comparable other vehicles, yeah. Right, well there is none. Right. So, so they didn't know. It's a one of one Right, by, so they, and million. that's what Steve always had the one of ones the super oddballs, like the, you know, yeah, the rack transit gotcha. cars or what have you. So, uh, or, or extreme survivors, you know? Yeah. They didn't know how to bid on it. And Steve bid more with his heart than his wallet because he just, that yeah. was what he liked. So that's how we were able to get the car. Gotcha. That was one thing about Steve I always admired about him. And if he liked something, because it was that rare and a one of one, he would really go out of his way to get it, just to have something that was very different. So when you step back and look at this car, with all of its features and all of its options on it, what would your favorite one be on it? I mean, it's a beautiful color too, right? Is this EK2, right? I don't think EK2 was available in 71. EV2 was. EK2 wasn't in 71, Mr. Code. Vitamin C Go Mango was 69, Oh, 70, I see what you're saying, I know what I was saying. I see what you did there, yeah. I know what you're doing. Okay, I didn't see the production date. It's a 71. Uh, there's some 71 slip through with EK2, so I appreciate really? your interest. Examples? Oh, sure. There's the Plymouth lineup that did it. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Look at this. He's having an internal struggle. Look at him. He, he looks sheepish. The you know, eyes are getting a little bit bigger, kind of getting that little cat that ate the mouse look on his face. Yeah, that's psychopathy. That's sick. And I think you should get some help. Uh, how much time you got? Show me, I mean, you're a proof of a car. Well, Lottie frickin' da, why don't I there just call up PPG right now and ask them why they put it on their color chart in 1971? Just keep in mind, I know what I'm talking about. I'm misspeaking on purpose. I'm checking him. That's all I'm doing, I'm checking him at the door, man. I know the EK2 ended in 1970, but if I say it like, hey, I think that's the EK2 on the 71, oh no, that there ain't. It gives him an opportunity, number one, to correct me, which he needs. Again, part of the psychopathy, it makes him feel better. But at the same time, I'm already in on the joke. I already know what's going on with it. This goes back to the timeless adage, the first liar doesn't stand a chance. So when you make a point and you throw out something like the PPG color charts, it's valid. If I use it, oh, that's aftermarket nope. stuff. It has nothing to do with the fact. Be, there's difference between book smart and real world smart. Um, who bought your lunch? I guess that's the question.
went pretty good. Did you pay attention? Yes, I watched you. Okay. That was single stage. Yeah. Whew. Again, number one painter. Send all resumes. You tried that last time. That's no. why I'm here. No, for different position. You're fine. We're not hiring. Yeah. I'm not quite ready to cut them loose on the body of a car. You know, so I think for right now, it's important to keep the gun time going, keep them in the direction that I have them going in. Then he just comes in and shadows me when I'm doing these final paints and kind of learn as much as he can. All right, so we're mixing up our black single stage. You remember the ratios, Brody? Four to two to one. It only took you two years? Nope. You like to pace yourself. It took me like three months because I took your information and put it in my phone, so I never forget. Well, you probably just knew we were doing this and just checked right nope. before. It's nice that when you edit your notes, it tells you what time you left off on it, so I can show you that. It also says on the paint can, so. We'll go in there. We'll start with the door on the farthest end, shoot the bottom half first, and if that goes good, you can go around and do the top half. Sounds good. I love you. Don't even start that. So with this, you know, I had no problems Brody painting hoods, doors, fenders, all the smaller pieces, because if he does make a mistake, it's easy to correct. So just start on that side, go from about right here all the way down. That's pretty weird. What? This sounds weird. Let me just finish this coat. I get home, Layla's always like, Dad, you're dirty. <laughs> Here's why. I just changed uh, my backup gun. I just don't know why that one was struggling. It felt like there was something in the needle, so the air wasn't going through smooth. It was kind of choppy. But we did get kind of lucky because it's black, single stage. So even though that for, first door may not lay out as great, you can put a lot on the you know, second, third coat, and it'll all be perfectly fine. <sighs> not too bad. I'm not being a smart ass. You watch it at home, it looks easy. You know, like, oh, heck, I can paint. But there's so much that can go wrong. That's what makes a good painter, is when you have a problem, getting past it, and that's what we did. So we'll use this other gun for the rest of it, and everything looks good. He did a great job on the final paint. Even if there was like a little imperfection here or there, we cut and buff it. So I have no complaints with how it came out. He did great. Still to come, Tony challenges Mark on his knowledge of the ultra rare 71 Challenger. Hold on. The Hemi Cuda that came on the Cuda. The Hemi Cuda. Ah. Uh, Oh, come on. Will Mark finally catch Tony making a mistake? Listen, we can't expect you to know everything. Or will Tony fight back and get personal? That's not orange, that's yellow. No, but it's almost the same color as the car. Mark's colorblind, so who knows what he sees and what he doesn't see. Picking on somebody is, is bullying, and now there's laws. And when Mark's alter ego invades the paint shop, will the cold reception bruise his real ego? Well, you're pulling it away. Let me finish. I'm the interviewer, right? Well, I don't know. So if I'm conducting the interview, you guys should be more respectful. Get the scoop when Graveyard Cars returns. So here's another example of NOS part. You said this thing's loaded with NOS Oh, part. my God. Walt Downer. Like the, I, yeah. the, the guy in the world that did it, that was him. Yeah. So these are NOS pins. So you can see here it's a black phosphate black washer, not a zinc. So that means the, the little star kind of extruded lock washer is probably on the bottom yeah. of it. Yes, it is. Okay. That's exactly yeah. right. And you know, the 426 Hemi emblems that go on a Challenger are different from a shaker than they are to the rally hood. And I thought that that was the same on a CUDA. No. So the CUDA is the same emblem. Hold on. The Hemi CUDA that came on the CUDA. The Hemi CUDA. Ah. Uh, uh, come on. You see that move there? You see that, right? 
I'm well aware of that the 1970-1971 CUDA with a 426 Hemi was never available with the Bolt Hood J54. Oftentimes it's on the LA cars listed there, but it's not supposed to exist. See, I, I speak because I'm trying to keep the people at home from falling asleep. So you I'm, misspeak, you mean? I'd rather misspeak and know they're awake than bore them to death with finite details. Am I the killer in Scream? Did I kill the Billy flag. Madison? Is that how you deflect yes. from an inaccuracy? Yeah, I throw into okay. movie references, and after a while, you just don't, you give up. That's true. <laughs> Fender tags, different than the Cuda over there, but this car's been restored. I know, and without seeing it, how it was originally, you see, you could see that the screw hole's missing, I but saw. it's on the tag. So that now, means the apron could have been replaced. Could have been replaced, or maybe just never got punched out. Again, hard to tell. Folks, you were talking about possibly the rarest car in the world for a 71 Challenger. Take one minute and look at that fender tag. The options this car has, so many, that it had to go on two fender tags. Now the third one's, of course, the Hemi fender tag. You know, as far as equipment on the car, I mean, this has eyeballs. I mean, it's bright orange, white top, so that just pops on it. But it's got the spoiler front and rear, power windows, a cassette deck, dictaphone. Of course, rally gauges are standard, four-speed console. It has all the external molding package, has that spring chrome on the front, that big wide stuff on the front, but it has the smaller trim on the belt molding and behind the hood like the SE cars had. I mean, it's just, it's just loaded and it's just a beautiful car. You know, the hood latch mechanism, that's all super trick. Impossible I mean, you to can find see it, stuff. right. Yeah, no way would you ever duplicate that thing today. You'd have to disassemble it and then get the finishes right and then reassemble it the way the factory did. And is that the same release or similar release to 71 Cuda? No, because this it does thing, the same job. Yeah, but it's a different shape out here, Very. right? Yeah. Because that comes above the grill where the right. crew comes into the grill. But here's something that, you know, Steve always had me look at the cars for when he was doing them for correctness, and we'd put our heads together. Black, and, yeah. and I don't know why I never picked up on this but at the time, but that should be black. That should, yeah. Uh, Steve is so meticulous, and he'd have myself and some other people that he felt knew a lot about the cars look at them and say, hey, what's wrong? What am I missing? Is everything right here? Maybe something changed in the time since he sold it, but the latch tray behind the grill is always supposed to be black, and this is painted body color. And I just really sort of have to go back, like at some old pictures, and see if it was done like that back then. And I just couldn't see the forest through the trees. I'm looking at markings on hardware, but missed a big part like that right in front of my face. But that's it. Looks like an NOS latch. I mean, so much NOS. Look NOS at the NOS colors on the washers support. in the front. See, remember I showed you before? Oh yeah, it's got that reddish, reddish hue to them. Yeah. Which match this part of the latch? The hood latch assembly is a multi-part item, and the finishes on it all vary. It's not like they just had a latch and it got dipped into a phosphate or a CAD coat or anything like that. It's multiple platings on multiple pieces with multiple use, and it would be impossible to duplicate that today unless you were manufacturing all the parts new and had the same machinery and rivets and tooling to put it together. And stuff like that just can't be done. But everything else underneath here is probably in OS. Yeah, like the wiper motor you could see is, you know. And the yellow running down daub on the master cylinder. Or orange for people that aren't colorblind. That's almost orange like the car, honestly. That's it, not orange, that's yellow. No, but it's almost the same color as the car. Somebody, tell them. Yeah, yeah, somebody tell me. Please tell me what I don't already know. I know I'm colorblind, okay? I was colorblind at birth, I'm a miracle. I can't see colors. I have no idea I, how I do what I do. But I, I shouldn't be bullied over it. You know, picking on me and making fun of me. You know, like something's wrong with me, like I'm sick. Like, I remember him, man. I just saw him the other day and he was fine. No, I'm still fine. I'm just the same colorblind I was when I came out of the womb. Okay, it's orange, fine. You know what? I still like to have ratings after okay, this listen episode. listen to me. What color is the mark on the power steering? Oh, here we go. No, no, I'm, Name I'm, that color. I'm, no, I'm, I'm just, you know, I love Mark. And I know he's colorblind, and I'm not trying to make fun of or pick on that, but the dot on the power brake boost, it was orange. It was almost the same color as the car. If you know the car is orange, how would you not know that the dot's orange? Oh yeah, that's not making fun of somebody by, by any stretch of the imagination. Now they have doctors that can expound on this, and I may have to actually have one on the show to explain this to him, and maybe you people out there who seem to think there's something wrong with me, because I can't see colors. <laughs> it's so funny. He's got things wrong with him that he can't help it. I don't point him out to him, right? You know why? Because I take the high road. He goes low, I go high. Mark thought it was yellow. I mean, I know yellow is not terribly far from orange, but this is an orange dot next to an orange car. How could you confuse it? Picking on somebody is, is bullying, and now there's laws. You, you can't make somebody push a penny 
around a toilet seat with their nose in ninth grade because you didn't like that they had a tumor in their foot. That's bullying, that's sick, and there should be something done about it before it's too late. What color? Uh, Orangish yellow. That's yellow. Okay. Dre Studios proudly presents the top-rated Mopar-themed news show. This is Graveyard Cars Action News, featuring the only Springfield-based, Chrysler-affiliated comedy journalist, your host, the man with a monosyllabic verb for a name, Scoop Cunningham. Scoop Cunningham here reporting live outside the paint booth at Graveyard Cars. Right now I'm talking with... Will? Brody. Will and Brody Scott, they have finished painting a beautiful job on a 1969 Dodge Charger. The 68, isn't it? Yeah. They just finished laying out a beautiful paint job on a 1968 Dodge Charger that gets a 392 engine. I wanted to just get a in the moment feeling from both of you guys. What were your thoughts as you were letting Brody, your son, do some of the first paint work he's ever done on that car? Felt great. Yeah. I mean, expand on that. So it felt, it felt great, that's good. What were your thoughts? What were your thoughts on that? It was, it was really exciting. Super cool. Did you, uh, were you nervous when you were painting some of your first, I mean, black's a difficult color to have come out right. Did you feel good about it? I felt good, but definitely nervous. Yeah, he felt nervous, folks, and that's one of the things that's gonna happen. I think, Will, is that fair? Did, did you feel nervous the first time you painted a black car? Absolutely. Yes. You, well, you're pulling it away, let me finish. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I was very nervous the first time, but after all these years, we got the hang of it. And we're able to pass that on to Brody now. Able to pass it on now, the torch, to his son Brody, which I think is very important. Listen, those cars have a lot of style lines on them, the 68, 69, 70 Chargers, second generation Chargers. Is it fair to say that really all the hard work is done by the preppers and the painters just get all the glory for it? Now, what, what are your thoughts on that right now, Will? That's absolutely true. Prepping is the most important part of it and the car's only gonna look good if the prep is right. So I do get the glory of being the one to paint it, but I would gladly pass that over to him or Anthony. What is your call name on social media? Number one painter. Yeah, so my question would be over to you. You've done all the prep work and it came out beautiful, but I don't see your name in lights right now. What's your gut feeling on this thing? Are you getting upset? No, not at all. I mean, you can go I'm, on, don't put your phone away. Picture of Brody painting saying, maybe retirement can happen. I'm the interviewer, right? Well, I don't know. So you... if I'm conducting the interview, you guys should be more respectful. When you stand back now and you see that car setting there in all of its glory, what are your feelings inside right now? I'm happy with it, how it came out. The prep work was great, the paint job was great. We're a team. Well, I agree. I have a question about under the hood. That looks as good as the outside of the car. How, how does that happen? Because we take the same steps on the inside of the car as we do the outside. The trunk, engine compartment, door jams, under the hood, all the jam work is done just as good as the outside of the car. In regards to prep work, do you find prepping a car that's gonna be painted black more difficult or less difficult than say if a car was gonna get painted white? Um. It doesn't matter what the color is of the car, we treat them all the same. A black is the hardest to do, so we treat every car like it's a black car. How many coats of the black paint did you put on it and what kind of paint did you use? DCU 9300. On the body of the car, we did four coats. On the jams, we did three coats. Brody, any final words here that I can get from you while you're kind of in the passion of the moment? No, this has been a fun interview, Mark. I'm glad you had this idea. I'm not me, I'm, I'm not you, I'm, I'm... I think you're going downhill, you're losing your audience. Okay, Tiny, back up to you in the booth. We're, he's right in front of us. Let's play along, you moron. Yeah. Because you know, exactly what's, on. On you know exactly what's going on. You know exactly what's going on. We're doing an interview. I'm Scoop Cunningham. When I'm wearing this outfit, all right, that's a cut. Scoop's the only one that says cut. You understand that? Brought to you by Drayson. 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 The sound of a generation. The sound of a number. Graveyard Cars Action News featuring the comedy journalism of Scoop Cunningham was brought to you by Trey Studios and Big Tony's Philly Steak Sandwiches. Big Tony's, fill up your tank with Big T's Philly Steak. Stay tuned for the final unraveling of this 426 Hemi 4-speed 71 Hemi Challenger. Plus, the 68 Charger Tribute finally receives its 392 Hemi. But will it do justice 
to its inspiration, the Bullet Charger, from one of the most famous car chases in cinema history. Judge for yourself when Graveyard Cars returns. Do you think this is an NOS radiator or just well detailed? Could be either, right? Could be either. I've he had NOS them. radiators, you know. So uh, what's the SPD on this car? 307. 307. 308, 308, I'm and sorry. And this looks like a first week of October, a 69 alternator. The 71 Hemi parts are way over the board. You've, you've seen that with some of the cars as far as engine assembly dates. Oh yeah, no. On Hemi cars, We've seen the assembly date of a component or the casting date of a component precede the scheduled production date of the car by even up to a year or, or longer. And we think that that's probably because they knew that the Hemi cars were very limited. An alternator is an alternator. If it's the same one in a 70 and the same one in a 71, they can use those casting dates. Now you would want to turn that alternator over and see when it was actually assembled. That appears on the bottom of it, it would be interesting to see. But coming through and trying to time code a Hemi car is not as easy as you think. They didn't make that many of them, so I think they made a lot of the parts early on, but then they didn't go in the cars till later. And the 407, you want to tell everybody what the 407 is? It's the last three digits of the engine assembly number. Yeah. And on the Hemis, they didn't put the transmission one over here, did they? I know they did it on the wedge engines, but I don't think they did it on the Hemi engine. It's possible the 407 calls out a four-speed right. or a manual all by itself, where yeah. the other ones could service both. It's possible. Okay, so a great example would be just take that same car, put it out in the middle of a field, been sitting there for 50 years, fender tag's gone, dash is gone. You know it's a Hemi car because it's got all the markings on it that a Hemi car would have. But you'd like to know what the scheduled production date is. Not close, but exactly. That's really hard to do. But with a car, normally speaking, that say wasn't a Hemi car, you could go up to the assembly date on the wiper motor, on the alternator. You could look at things that were put together for the car, even the assembly date on the engine, would be really close to the scheduled production date, sometimes a month ahead, but rarely ever a year ahead. Here we've got an alternator that's got a 69 casting date for a car that was built in March of 71. Now this has an inspector tag just, we, this is the second yep. one I've seen in my life. Yeah. And they hang that one down, but like I say, you can't really trust everything on this because it's been Right, restored. Restored, you know, right. Unless you had pictures of it before. It but was... nicely restored, don't oh, get me oh, wrong. No, no, I miss. No. <laughs> well, it's like some of the things you'd just say that 71 Cuda was left outside and needed to be restored. Are you gonna redo the drip on the tail panel? You're gonna do right, the, the right. uh, undercoating shooting right. all over the place? The only reason that works is it started life that way. Right. Otherwise, I've restored it and my hands are on it. So if you would have had a run on your Daytona, you could document it, would you have wanted Mike? Probably not. You'd probably want the right, because it's hard to explain on a restored right, car. Right, you're explaining it the whole time. Yeah, yeah, it's all you're doing is, oh, cheap paint job. No, no, I did that on purpose. Sure you did. Will and Brody did an amazing job on the 68. Once that 68 Charger was painted, uh, immediately went over and they put the panels on it. After that, Doug and I moved straight forward with the engine install. We had the Magnum Force front suspension ready for it. We had the 392. It had already been pre-fit for the six-speed transmission. We had the Dana. We have all those components in there. And now you have a 1968 Dodge Charger, modern day version of a bullet car with a 392 Hemi, Magnum Force power rack and pinion front suspension disc brakes six speed Tremix manual transmission Dana 6014 gears. You have got a car and take a look at the Craigers. I don't think Bullet had Craigers, I think it had hubcaps, but that's okay. We'll let them have what we call the Tony D'Agostino Liberty. I love when you direct. Yeah.